Good morning, everyone, and welcome. I'm grateful for everyone's presence, and we're going to go ahead and just jump right in and, and get started. And I will pass it on to Gary to start us in our welcome. Thank you, Saba. And um, it's really my pleasure today to welcome you all to the webinar and those who may watch the recording thereafter. My name is Gary Painter. And I have the privilege of being the director of the Homelessness Policy Research Institute. And for those of you for whom the Institute is new, who we are is a collaborative of over 100 researchers, policymakers, service providers, and people with lived experience of homelessness. And our goal, our mission is to accelerate equitable and culturally informed solutions to homelessness in Los Angeles County uh, by advancing knowledge and fostering transformational partnerships between research, policy, and practice. Um, this is a, a really important panel. It certainly has critical implications for those of us who are doing work here in Los Angeles, but it's an opportunity for us to learn from people who are doing work either as researchers, practitioners, um, people with lived experience in our West Coast cities. So all the way up and down from you know, Seattle, the Bay Area, to Portland, to San Francisco, the Bay Area there, to um, et cetera, down to San Diego, we face something that's commonplace and the most common kind of, I guess the common characteristic is that we all have high housing prices. Importantly, not just high housing prices, but prices and rents that have been going up faster than people's incomes, especially people with low and moderate income for quite a while now. So much so that, you know, we've done some analysis here in the state of California and found that now there's 1.2 million households who are paying more than half their income in rent. And that 1.2 million households are at much more elevated risk for becoming homeless simply for ec economic reasons. And so we're here today and we've invited, as I mentioned before, colleagues from each one of these places to answer a set of questions to teach us about how their communities are wrestling with these issues, to tell us something about how high housing costs contribute to the experience of homelessness in their areas, to understand how policy and practice debates are emerging to address these specific issues, and what might be the, the trends in service and policy related to um, moving people who are experiencing homelessness to being housed in ways that have showing or showing some promise or actually if the speakers would would be, feel comfortable saying you know this is actually working and so we might be in that kind of liminal space of this is seems like it might be working to some where this is actually working in our areas so with that um i will return to to ask questions of the panel later but saba uh, please take it away Thank you so much, Gary. And before we get in further in, into our program today, I just want us to take a deep breath. And it's also for me <laughs> in terms of having navigated those Zoom issues and, and also um, coming from a place to really um, ground myself in acknowledging that the land that we, we are all on here in the, in the Los Angeles region. Um, so we wanna acknowledge the Gabrielino Tongva peoples as the traditional land caretakers of Tavangar. And we acknowledge our presence on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Chumash, Keech, and Tataviam nations. And we recognize and are committed to lifting up their stories, culture, and community. And we pay our respects to the ancestors, elders, past, present, and emerging, and all of the ancestors that are represented here in our virtual circle today. And so as uh, Gary shared, we are going to hear from uh, various panelists all up the coast, uh, the West Coast. And um, then we will go into a panel discussion followed by a Q&A. So we do invite you to please, please go ahead and Give us those questions, just put them in the Q&A box as soon as you have them. We also invite you to, um, to our conversation on, on social media. 
and uh, and so that we, you know, expand this circle um, to talk about these uh, commonalities and hopefully innovations in the work that we do collectively on the West Coast. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's exciting that we're, we're going to be starting from the very far northern part of our representative, our representation of the West Coast today in Seattle, Washington. And then we're going to travel south uh, to Portland, to the Bay, San Francisco Bay Area, and then close with um, our very own Los Angeles County. Uh, and I just want to uh, do a check to see, okay, we're all here. We're all met. We're all able to get past the Zoom. Um, and I'm really delighted to first invite uh, Felice, Felicia Salcedo and Rachel File. And I'm going to ask all of our panelists just to do uh, a little uh, self intro. You can share how you come to this work or your name and title. And I invite all of us to look at um, our event page so that you can get their full bio because these are all incredible, um, incredible people and, and doing amazing work. Um, and then after that, we will go to hear Marisa Zapata, um, Chris Weir, and then close out with our very own Reba Stevens. And with that, I'm going to stop my sharing and I'm going to offer the floor to uh, Rachel and Felicia. Good morning. Um, my name is Rachel File, and I'm an associate professor at the Evans School of Public Policy and Governance at the University of Washington here in Seattle, Washington. Um, and uh, Felicia, do you want to introduce yourself and then I'll kick us off? Sure, happy to. Hi, everyone. I'm Felicia Salcedo. And I'm the executive director at We Are In, which is a funders collaborative um, focused on homeless housing issues here in Seattle, King County. We have um, a bit of a tag team effort this morning. So I'm going to start with a few thoughts and then turn it over to Felicia. Um, as you can expect, talking about uh, housing and homelessness in West Coast cities is not high cost. West Coast city is not necessarily the cheeriest topic, um, but I'm actually going to start us off with a few, um, I think, wins or at least positive directions that we've experienced in our community um, recently, kind of since and during the course of the pandemic and, and whatever this may be post-pandemic time is. Um, so the first thing I want to mention is that we, um, early on in the pandemic, as many cities around the country did, uh, engaged in a de-intensification or de-densification of our congregate emergency shelter system. And this was a rapid response here in King County in combination with the county government and the city of Seattle and the nonprofit providers to move, uh, to, to make the congregate shelters safer and in many cases to actually disband the congregate shelters and move them to hotel spaces, places where people had greater privacy and, um, and more space to, uh, to, to have as private space, private bathrooms. Um, and this was a change that was really motivated by the the danger of COVID, right? The risks of being in a congregate setting with lots of people in one places and in one place, and the the fear of disease spread. Now, what we saw, as as you may have heard um, here, as well as other places, is that the change from congregate shelters to non congregate settings, in this case, uh, hotels had uh, all sorts of positive impacts on the folks who were um, staying in these congregate shelters originally and now in non-congregate shelters. So in addition to the reduction of the risk of contracting COVID, um, there was also positive impacts on general health and well-being, improved engagement with staff, reduced conflict among the those staying in the non-congregate shelters, and really this um, this sense that uh, that this was a much better way to help address the crisis of homelessness. Now, I'm sure you're thinking, and we all know, this is not rocket science. Anyone who is um, in an emergency housing situation would prefer to stay in a hotel room or a hotel-like atmosphere. Um, you know, and we did interviews um, with some, I, uh, I was part of a research team with colleagues at University of Washington and um, at the county, 
and you know, we talked to the the providers, we talked to the executive directors of the nonprofits, and they said, well, yeah, we've known for a long time that what we're doing is not a great way to help address folks' uh, needs when they're in crisis. But it really was the the um, pandemic that allowed that political will to transform the shelter system into one that has much greater reliance on these non congregate settings. So, okay, we learned that lesson, but what's really exciting about that is from there, we have launched um, locally, now King County has a health through housing program that is a permanent program that was launched in fall 2020 and includes a dedicated funding stream that comes from sales tax revenue for the purchase of motels, hotels, um, nursing homes, other places that might be more appropriate for our emergency shelter. And some will be converted into affordable housing uh, for permanent housing. Um, currently, we have 10 locations. And by the end of this year, um, there's an expectation of up to 1,600 units that have been added. So this is um, I, uh, an opportunity where uh, we should have known this lesson a long time ago, and yet the pandemic allowed the political will, and we're continuing to move in that positive direction. The other, um, I think, win that I want to mention is that we have also recently passed, uh, a, a year ago, Washington State became the first state in the nation to pass a right to counsel law, which uh, allows for requires legal representation in eviction cases um, for folks who meet a certain pretty generous income threshold. And so that um, implementation has been taking place over the past year. We're now at full implementation across all of our counties. Um, more than 4,500 tenants have been represented by attorneys. Um, it's a little bit early to know what kind of outcomes were uh, we can expect, although we are seeing that the eviction or unlawful detainer cases have gone down from historic levels. Um, you can imagine there were a lot of eviction moratoria still in place when this law was passed. So being able to have that time to, to set up the implementation before the moratoria expired was really crucial. And now we're kind of watching to wait and see if the cases go back to pre-pandemic um, pre levels, but having this as, a, as an additional protection for tenants and a way to really even the playing field in um, in these eviction cases, I think is um, is a win and something that we're hopeful will have a long term impact in our state in the um, in terms of increasing housing security among low income tenants. Um, and I think the, the last thing I'll mention, and, and I'll turn it over to Felicia, who will have a, probably a little more on this topic, is um, our housing market, like, like all of yours, has been bonkers for years. Um, today in the front page of the Seattle Times was yet another story about a drop in the home uh, home value for home sales. Um, we've also seen recently a decrease in uh, rents, you know, just after after kind of a very sharp increase over years. These corrections are not going to suddenly change our um, our our market to be affordable, but I'm hopeful that we'll get a little bit of relief from some of these recent trends. Um, and thank you so much for this opportunity. It's great to be here with all the West Coast colleagues. I look forward to your questions. Thanks, Rachel. Um, so just to add a little bit more context for what's happening here in Seattle King County, I think there's a, another thing that I'm super proud of in our community. And some of you may know that we've done a lot of work around our governance here. So we had a very disjointed crisis response system, and it really didn't allow for a lot of accountability for how dollars are spent and how we're really serving uh, the public in our community here. And so we have created what is now called the King County Regional Homeless Authority, which creates one kind of pot of resources and a place for accountability for the work that's moving forward. And what's very uh, different, I would say, about that in, in the way that we've operated in the past is that we have really centered the leadership of people with lived experience of homelessness themselves. And so um, for all of the governance for that new entity, people with lived experience of homelessness sit at the table. Um, they make decisions, they drive policy, they give feedback on how services are operating in real time, and they're part of a larger collective. So they're not um, selected by service providers to serve in those roles. They're not um, tokenized in the way that we have uh, used lived experience participation in the past, but they really are representing themselves and the larger collective of people who have experienced homelessness um, in service of our community and the work that's happening here. And so that's been a, a huge change for our community, a huge um, muscle that we're still trying to build. We have 
we're very lucky here to have the Washington State Lived Experience Coalition, which has just been a great model. Um, and I know they're working with other communities to try to build uh, leadership and build power amongst people with lived experience of homelessness to replicate this across the country. But that has been very critical, I think, in our, our response system here and the way that we're trying to do things differently um, and definitely leaning into our values around racial equity in particular, knowing that people of color are much more likely to experience homelessness, not only here in Seattle King County, but across the nation as well. And so um, having people with that experience at the center has really transformed the way that we we do our work here. And, and again, our ability to make changes in real time that better support um, the folks that we intend to serve. The other thing I would highlight in the way that we've been uh, doing work here that I think is is helpful, but we're also you know, still learning on this front is the narrative change piece. And so really having that broad public support, as Rachel was saying, we had this huge opportunity with COVID um, to be able to make changes to the way that we do business and building that political will amongst elected officials, but also with the general public to make those changes quickly with urgency uh, to address the crisis at scale. And so we're trying to build on the good work that's been happening here um, in order to continue to, to have positive support for the things that we need to take to scale. So we were able to, in addition to federal resources that were coming in, um, have huge investments from our state legislature to address the crisis of housing and homelessness in ways that we haven't seen in, in previous um, sessions. So that was really helpful and it's now allowed for a huge infusion of resources, which helps our local governments be able to do their jobs better. We really need those resources and those investments from our, our federal partners and at the state level as well to see the progress that we wanna see as it relates to homelessness. Um, as Rachel mentioned, our housing market makes it very difficult to use things like vouchers in the community and other programs um, that are really reliant on the private housing market. And so for our local governments here to be able to purchase properties um, and do master leasing agreements as well has allowed us to move more people into housing much more quickly than if we were relying on permanent supportive housing units to come online, which we know takes quite some time um, in every community as well. So those are the kinds of levers that we're trying to uh, really to use so that we can see progress and help people with the urgency that's required because the numbers of people experiencing homelessness have continued to grow, even though we've been able to increase the amount of people our, our system serves over the course of a year. So really that inflow is what is outpacing our ability uh, to match the need in our community here. So I would, I would definitely highlight that, and I'm I'm sure other communities are facing those same challenges. So very curious to hear more about what other folks are doing. Wonderful. I just want to highlight some of these themes um, for us in, ref in reflecting back around this theme around non-congregate shelter and how providers have known that 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 that's what people need and want, and now you know this has been an opportunity to really give them that. The piece around right to counsel, that's really exciting. Definitely we'll be tracking that and wishing that the rent costs would go down here in Los Angeles. I hope that we like, you know, catch that wave. Um, that was really exciting. And thank you too, Felicia, for, you know, just sharing about this uh, incredible work that's happening in your region by seed, about seeding power to people with lived experience and noting the disproportionate rate um, of, of people of color. Um, and so we're really talking about people of color in this conversation. So thank you for grounding us in that. Um, and yeah, that influx of money, it really did a lot of things. It really helped us to see how we can move more quickly. So, so really appreciate the work that you all are doing there. Um, and I want to now invite Marisa um, to, to share about what um, what's happening in her community in, in Portland, Oregon. Hi, thank you for having me. It's great to always hear what is happening up and down the West Coast. We're obviously seeing nationally as a conglomerate facing very similar issues, which is true, but I also think that we are having some distinct challenges and in very different political environments and functionally in different states. Um, I am an urban planner originally, and I had the privilege to be invited into homelessness work as a participant on our county um, newly created continuum of care in 2014. And they really revisioned what a continuum of care could be. So not just meeting the federal requirements of oversight for budgeting um, and implementation of the coordinating um, continuum of care funding from HUD, 
Actually, does everybody know all of these terms? Can I shorten this or should I spell them all out carefully? You can feel free to spell spell them out. Great. I am always happy to do that. Um, so yes, so the Department of Housing and Urban Development at the federal level um, creates these local jurisdictional implementers for homelessness funding and policy. And they have specific requirements. I know that in Los Angeles, who gets on the continuum has been in the papers and it can be a, a fight to the death to be able to get on. Um, you know, and and one of the recommendations, I think this is important in the research context from HUD is to have researchers participate on the continuum. What was going along with this was the new merger between the city and the county to uh, have one joint office of homeless services. And this should certainly resonate in the Seattle region and in Los Angeles when we make these decisions to unify continuums and not. not. Um, and with that, the, the COC, the continuum of care, was an envision to be a very large stakeholder body. And my research is in collaborative government and participatory democracy and racial equity. Um, one of the things that was also happening in Portland was the rise of racial equity and racial equity lenses, and really wanting to say we're going to prioritize racial equity both in our processes and in our outcomes. It was very unclear what would happen in that context, um, particularly for the adult population. The Portland region is very white, and that is obviously very different for our youth now, probably not obviously, different for our youth. But um, especially in the city center, we are a very white community. Um, which raises issues for both representation on boards, but also in terms of analyzing data for racial equity. And yet we can still see how pronounced racial inequity is both in the county, as well as in the state. Um, Black people made up into 2021, 16.1% of the houseless population. That was more than double their share of the population in Multnomah County. At the state level, we know that African-Americans are 2.5 times more likely than whites to become homeless, and Native Americans are 3.5 more times more likely. Like many places, we um, struggle with what's called the Latino paradox, right? Seeing lower rates in homelessness than we know that are actually out there. In addition to the board immediately saying, we are going to prioritize racial equity, the board also moved to have a local definition of homelessness that included doubled up populations. So HUD has a very narrow definition of homelessness. That means you're in emergency shelter or you're living unsheltered in a car, warehouse, et cetera. There's some other cases, but that is what the gist ends up kind of being. Um, and we know from listening to people of color and listening to providers, that a lot of our people of color are living doubled up. Doubled up is different than the stereotype of the college student who graduated from a fancy school, maybe USC, um, hanging out at their parents' house because they just don't feel like getting a job. Um, this is people who are living unsafely at risk to their own leases, serious overcrowding, um, landlord scrutiny. So that definitional change was done in the service of racial equity. In 2014, the, and I was just talking about this with a colleague, it was an amazing moment to enter that work and um, the work on homelessness. There was so much optimism about what we were aiming towards and heading towards. The providers were largely on board with housing as the solution to homelessness and not thinking that we had to still exist in these patriarchal um, parenticizing structures of you must participate in programs and so forth. Um, we, of course, had seen that this was driven by the escalation of the housing market, um, massive increases in homelessness in response to our tightening housing market. Today, we do not, we see a little bit of a decrease in rents, but that is solely at the luxury level. So we have luxury apartment buildings that are standing empty and for sale. And I think a really interesting current context is nobody will buy them. I keep posting them on Twitter. I'm like, look, I found another building. It's empty. No local government will buy them. Most of the nonprofits don't want them. So this gets into the politics of today. Um, we, 
um, really, again, like this, it was very powerful. We had two bonds come online, one for the city and one through the tri-county being run by our regional government. Portland has a formal regional government called Metro, and that is elected officials. So we it's not a governance structure. It's like a real, it's a real boy in the language of Pinocchio. Um, and they then subsequently put through um, a massive supportive housing services measure that's modeled after Los Angeles um, that the voters approved $248 million a year for 10 years, taxed on people of upper um, middle class to upper incomes. Um, this is massive. That is an unparalleled amount of money for services as well as for prevention. Um, and if people want to dive in, like just the whole discussion of how much was going to prevention, what did prevention mean, what was going to services, what did services mean, um, is quite fascinating in and of itself. Um, so I think that there has just been tremendous optimism until, and now here's the bad, until like now. <laughs> and now it is quite terrible and terrifying. Um, the county and city's relationship has continued to devolve over time and has ended up at the point that there is, you know, letters against each other printed in the press, side comments, true fighting. But that fighting is actually principled. And it is, you know, seeing that the county is trying to hold the line and protect that housing is what we need, prevention is what we need. Show services on the street, particularly the way that they're being asked for, argued for by the city, is not a pathway that is humane or dignified and will actually harm the work right, in addition to just not being effective. Um, so we have seen a dramatic increase in sweeps, uh, lots of focus on moving people around, which of course we all know in addition to the harm is impractical because people just go back to where they were or they're just camping someplace else. Um, but more troubling, the city council has adopted um, this fall uh, the decision to create um, six camps that would be 100 people each to 250 people long term each, um, likely run by a nonprofit out of Los Angeles because none of our providers will touch it. And um, with a, a goal to have a camping ban within a year and a half. And the stated intent that if people won't go to the camps, then they can go to jail or psychiatric care or so forth. And again, those things are often like LOL because we don't have any spaces in our jails or in our psychiatric hospitals. Um, but they're moving on the camps quickly. At the same time, they're trying to demand money from the county. They're holding part of the money they were supposed to give to the county hostage now. And the county is going to have to shut down programs. They're also still demanding more money for the, from the county to create their camps. So then we end up in this situation of how much of this is rhetoric, how much of this is stated intent. The harm is real. And no matter what case, um, I was part of a forum where the two elected officials championing this work um, listened to people with lived experience of homelessness talk and share their thoughts and feelings and experiences. Just the, the, the threat of this is so harmful and hurtful and makes the work harder, right? Like why should people trust the government is gonna provide for them long-term? Um, so, you know, we've seen this push to camps and, you know, my, my research center that I, um, that I run um, actually did a study on how to do pod villages effectively and humanely, right? What does it look like to work with people to build their ideal village that they want to live in? Um, but that's, of course, not the most cost-effective solution. We have purchased motels. Um, we do have a state program to purchase motels for, um, for shelter, emergency shelter. Uh, I would not say that the city or the county have really jumped into that um, for good and bad reasons. Um, but yeah, um, the other thing I think that we see as like a really powerful um, thing that is happening here is a lot of mutual aid groups coming out, particularly in, um, in 
during the time of COVID. So really seeing community members rally and try to just provide basic services. Um, the city, the city does not want to fund the most obvious basic services to a real degree, like putting porta potties out or other hygiene type activities. Um, they want to just pivot to these camps. Um, lastly, I think in a research sense, the thing that I really have to, to fight against is what defines success for the work. And for the general public, success is fewer tents. And um, I think that even the people would accept fewer tents if they weren't seeing people in acute mental distress. I mean, they might accept more tents if they weren't seeing people who were truly suffering living outside. And of course, doing things like relieving themselves outside because they have no choice. Um, and so I think that as a researcher, I'm constantly having to think about how do I fight this while also knowing that this isn't good research. It's not particularly useful. I mean, sometimes I feel like I'm just beating my head against the wall, proving yet again that PSH, the housing is the solution to homelessness, and maybe don't have terrible metrics for what means success. So that's my time. I will say amazing people. We are working. We are working hard to combat and to be a community against these evil tides. But it is a very different context than five or six years ago. Well, thank you so much, Marisa. Again, I just want to reflect back some of the themes that you shared. I mean, um, just the revisioning your COC and, and thinking about research as part of it, I think is is um really noteworthy. Um, and then and then I, I think we all saw that rise of the race equity lens, but I think that it has a particularly um interesting context in your state understanding the history of uh, basically Oregon being a red line state and, and all of the different um, incidents of white supremacy in, in, in Oregon's history. I recommend people to, to learn about that. Um, and then those themes around uh, uh, homelessness as it pertains to people of color and that, that piece around um, the doubling up and that not being counted, that's a certain, certainly an innovation that you all in your region have acknowledged that that is a form of homelessness. Um, and we have similar rates of disproportionality. Um, and I, and I will, I, I will even like just probably guess that all of us have at least twice the rates of, uh, black and indigenous, uh, people people experiencing homelessness and similar issues with their data with our Latina community as well. So just a, a major theme there. And um, yeah, that I just want to emphasize what you said about services on the street um, as really not being like the end goal. Um, and um, and that piece around trust in, in government um, and how that you know is is really vital to to be able to get these um, resources out. So thank you very much, Marisa. We so appreciate um, just all that you said and your your presence here. And we're painting this this picture now. Um, it's really coming into focus. So I'd like now to invite Chris to share with us about the Bay Area. Okay, I'll probably be talking more about the Bay Area, some on LA, since I have that so, some of my knowledge base. But yeah. over the weekend, the story a story came across my news feed, which really encapsulated what I wanted to talk about today. And that was the, the county and the city political leaders had a press conference, and they declared that they had a new historical agreement to deal with homelessness. And the, and the agreement was going to implement a new measure that's just passed that's uh, criminalizing encampments. And this historic partnership is going to create more shelter beds. It's going to increase behavioral health services. It's going to increase the amount of substance abuse treatment available and, and uh, increase the number of outreach workers. All very good things. But buried in the fine print of this agreement, in fact, on the very last page for those policy wonks who actually read such agreements, is that they finally mentioned something about affordable housing. It was just an afterthought. And is it an action plan? No. What this agreement says that in six months, they will come together and offer a plan to increase affordable housing. Just a plan. This is not a new problem. 
the loss, the LAO, the loss, uh, legislative analyst's office in California, they wrote their first report stating that California was having a major shortfall in the amount of housing that was constructed. And that re first report was in 1990, 32 years ago. So we've known about this problem for decades. We've allowed it to fester for decades. And what I find particularly dispiriting when I, do, when I research homelessness programs is that um, additional, without additional housing, none of our major policy initiatives to address homelessness work. Take housing choice vouchers. So a housing choice voucher, what used to be called Section 8 housing, allows you to pay just a third of your income for rent and the government will pick up the rest. A lot of very good evidence suggests that people who have housing choice vouchers are dramatically less likely to fall into homelessness than compared to people who don't. So based on that, we did a great thing. The uh, American Rescue Plan in, uh, in 2021 allocated billions of dollars to create over 70,000 new housing choice vouchers nationwide. So have we housed 70,000 people using those vouchers? And the answer is a resounding no. In the United States, less than 57% of these vouchers have actually led to someone to be housed in an apartment. In California, it's far worse. It's, 50, it's less than 50% for California as a whole. In LA, it's only 20%. In Santa Clara County, it's only 21% of those people. Between Santa Clara County and San Francisco, they have a thousand vouchers right now that are going unused because they cannot find a landlord who will accept the voucher and allow someone to move into an apartment. So that's a, a program, a great idea. It used to work, but because of the state of the housing market, it's not working right now. Look at rapid rehousing. It's another um, foundational program in, in homelessness. It provides up to two years of subsidies for rent and support services to move people from homelessness and to get them back into stable housing. In, um, in my research in Sacramento, the, uh, the success rate of moving people into permanent housing went from over 80% of the people in this program in 2015 to less than 50% in 2019. And it's probably even worse right now. Uh, in San Francisco, Hamilton families had such difficulty using their vouchers, using that program for people experiencing homeless in San Francisco, they were moving them to Sacramento to be able to find housing for them. Now, I, I laud them for thinking out of the box, but the, uh, one of the things that they found is that there were real negative aspects that we were moving people away from, from their social networks and their supports. Right now I'm doing a, um, an evaluation of safe parking in Los Angeles. That's an important problem for people who are living in their vehicles while experiencing homelessness. This is a, a segment of the population that is usually doing better. Many of them are employed. Many fewer of them have severe mental illness or substance abuse um, problems. Um, a negative aspect of this is that this population, because they're a little bit better, they don't qualify for rapid rehousing or permanent supportive housing or the main subsidized housing programs. And when we talk to the caseworkers, the main problem that they talk about is that the lack of affordable housing, they can't do anything. They have, they have money from the Hilton Foundation, and thank you the Hilton Foundation who's in, who's in the audience right now, to provide to, um, to support people to get into that housing, either by providing them first month's rents to eliminate debts, use it in any way that's useful. But even with these additional resources, they're finding it extremely difficult to move this particular population precisely because that the, the availability of affordable housing in Los Angeles is so short. Now, we can look also look at um, permanent supportive housing, which provides um, rent subsidies, permanent rent subsidies, and um, social supports, typically for people who are suffering from a serious mental illness. It's a great program. It has lots of success. But here in California, the program has had incredible difficulties because um, the construction of permanent supportive buildings has been stymied by community opposition 
and just incredibly high costs, where sometimes it costs a million dollars or more to build a single unit of, um, of permanent supportive housing. And this is not always the way things was. When Sam Samberis created the idea of housing first in New York, he didn't build buildings to house these people. He just housed them in apartments. He gave them subsidies and he put them into in apartments. And in fact, he had a rule that there was going to be no more than five clients in any single apartment building. This is, has great benefits because there's a lot of research and evidence indicating that integrating people who have experienced homelessness, people with severe mental illness in typical um, communities has a great beneficial impact for, for those individuals. But we're just not able to achieve that anymore. So going back to my Sacramento story, um, increasing the supply of affordable housing, it can't be the last thing that we talk about in an agreement. It has to be the first thing because everything else that we're talking about, more, um, <clears throat> more outreach, more shelters, everything else, none of that really reduces homelessness until we have a place to place these people at the end of the day. So what do we do? Uh, the silver lining of this situation perversely, it's not, it's not really a silver line, but is that the situation is so bad, anything that we do is an improvement. And so I'm, I'm open to any single idea that increases additional housing. Um, Scott Wiener wants to tear down the freeway in the middle of San Francisco, he just announced yesterday. That's the freeway that I use to drive to work and that's gonna increase my commute. Tear down that freeway, put in housing all along all along that new corridor. I, tot I can totally support that. So let me just talk about two things that are slightly um, off the, the map, but I still think are ideas that we should be building on. One is accessory dwelling units or ADUs. We're allowed to, people are allowed now to build an ADU in their backyard. And we've built um, somewhere over 20,000 ADUs in, in California since, since they were allowed. Uh, and I'm trying to build one right now on my property. We can greatly increase the, and get towards that goal of having 200 new housing units per year in California if we really facilitated this. The benefit is that in some ways it's in people's own interest, own economic interest. If you build an ADU, you can potentially get a stream of income from rents by, by renting out a, a corner of your property. There can be snags, it can be very expensive. For example, I'm being required to build a $50,000 septic system to build my ADU uh, uh, on my community uh, uh, to get it done. So it can be very expensive. But there are ways where governments can provide low cost interest funds and uh, and technical assistance that would that would facilitate people. Like most people are not property developers and they don't understand how to put a new new unit on their property. That's a very daunting task. If we can help them financially and with technical assistance, I am sure we could get a lot more um, ADUs. Um, another idea that uh, is, is very fringe, but also I, I think promising are community land trusts. What a community land trust is, it acquires land either through purchase or through donations, and then they remove that land from the private market. They place deed restrictions on that land so that it will be affordable in perpetuity. Um, I'm on the board of, a, um, of the community land trust in the Sleepy Beach community that I live in uh, 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 quite a bit. And when I looked it up, our community land trust has 5% of the entire housing stock, either currently renting it out or in development. And we have probably very close to 100% of the affordable units. And so by, uh, but by supporting these organizations, by do donating them, it may be a way to get these housing units um, online. Uh, <clears throat> The last thing that, I, that, um, that I'll say, which is in accordance with what everyone else has said, is that we need to change the debate that constructing more affordable housing has to be the first order of business and not the last order of business whenever we speak about it. That's not the solution, but if we don't talk about it, we can't come up with that solution. So thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Chris. I really uh, just want to reflect back these really important nuggets and information and that you gave us. I mean, that piece around any any housing policy with regards to California or anywhere that has an issue of homelessness needing to to really, really include um, in preference, like and foundationalize af affordable housing, is is just such an important uh, theme that I, I really uh, appreciate and want to emphasize. Um, and then that piece that we're we're experiencing the same issue over here with regards to people not being able to use these these vouchers, um, and as you well noted that 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 rate of 50%, um, less than 50% utilization across the country. And, you know, I, I think that's really important th to note that the reason why is because of our housing markets. Um, uh, and and thank you too for your work around safe parking. Uh, I think, you know, that that's just really vital to think about that community and, and how they have or have not the same kind of access to, to resources. Um, so again, it's just such, uh, there's so much more that I, I just, last thing I'll touch on is um, out of the interest of time is this piece around um, housing first. And, you know, that, that if we build buildings, then how are we not, if we're, if we're thinking all of our affordable housing units, as you know, buildings for versus scattered site, then how are we not institutionalizing community members? Um, you know, how, how are we thinking about the the effects of of institutionalizing people? Um, and so, thank you for raising that point. And I'm just so grateful uh, for our next speaker, Ms. Reva Stevens, who. Um, you know, is just such a, a a wonderful leader and advocate in our community. And now I, I'd like to welcome her to the floor to respond to, to what we've heard and to share um, her wisdom with us. So thank you very much, Reba. Good morning, everyone. And, and thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be here, uh, to participate today. And I want to thank the panel. Um, you know, for their insights and sharing what's happening in their, you know, in their communities. You know, what's interesting is that one thing that I didn't hear today um, is those who are dying um, across the United States and particularly uh, in the areas in which um, the panel, panelists uh, reside. Um, you know, this is a, what I call the sixth season at this particular time of year and the climate in which we're in for those who are cold and California and Los Angeles County, I don't believe has ever been as cold as it is um, in these days. Um, there was something that was said earlier about um, a timeline and I just want to note that I go back, um, I spent 21 years of my life unhoused and I have been sheltered and permanently housed and the, for 24 years, and so we're talking about 45 years. And previous to that, I was aware of people who were unhoused. And so then I would count at 50, over 50 years. But look at us and where we are, and it looked nothing like it does uh, today. There was conversation about um, vouchers, and I thought about a couple of things and the, the increase of housing here in Los Angeles County. Right now, with the housing authorities' uh, vouchers, we're looking at um, twenty-one over twenty-one hundred dollars for a one-bedroom unit. For a two-bedroom unit, we're looking at roughly about twenty-seven hundred, and that's versus city and county. And I believe that if we we're going to talk about affordable housing, that we have to first start with our government. You know, how can we afford? How can anyone afford that? price unless you have that Section 8 voucher. And what happens is that it tells all landlords, oh, well, if they can get, uh, you know, if they're paying that amount, then we have to raise our rents too. And so I think we have to really hold, look at across the board accountability um, and from our, our government, state and local. Uh, it's, it's really, really important uh, to do that. 
uh, the, the conversation that um, uh, when it was mentioned around the Project Room Key, one of the things that I noticed here in Los Angeles County is, you know, that seemed to have been a grand solution to addressing uh, a crisis that was in front of us. However, I found that it was also uh, an opportunity for people to um, uh, be more destructive in their substance use because it provided a a place with a door to shut, to get, um, you know, as high as you want to. But I wanna make sure that I am actually addressing what I believe are a host of solutions to so many, to so many of the um, challenges that uh, we have. And particularly those of us who are unhoused on the streets of Los Angeles. And one of them is to really take a look at what use, what it used to be like and what services look like uh, many, many years ago. And what they looked like was uh, you come inside and when you came inside, you came into a place where there were rules, regulations, guidelines, and procedures. I'm gonna say that again. There were rules, regulations, guidelines, and procedures. And perhaps you know, many of us didn't like that. But at the end of the day, it actually was the beginning of preparing me and others to enter into becoming permanently housed and retaining our housing. So we had chores and chores are critical because it actually taught me how to be prepared and ready when I move into my unit, how to clean the bathroom, <laughs> you know, how to sweep the floor, how to use a broom again. You know, these things that seem, um, you know, like they're not important, they're very important. Because what it says is that I'm being treated with dignity and respect. I am someone. I also want to remind us that we're not talking about people who are homeless. We're talking about human beings. We're talking about real live folks. And we have a humanitarian crisis. And until we begin to acknowledge the fact that labeling is also very uh, stigmatizing, uh, in my opinion. And it's even something that I had to discover as a person with lived experience who have been outside for many, many years, that, that labeling, um, investing, investing in us as people, as human beings is truly important. You know, you think about what happens when we are entering bridge homes or you pulling us off the street into shelters. But what do you, now you got us, what you gonna do with us? Now you got us, what you gonna do with us? And until we begin to invest financially, invest in the people that are inside, have come inside, whatever that inside looks like or wherever that inside is, in order for us to be more attractive from the inside out when, you know, applying for, for units to rent. You know, and also being neighborly, learning how to get along with the landlord. We never talk about the social instinct that many of us, that social inclusion, so that we can actually, um, you know, be able to come back in, into society and, and be treated with, uh, with dignity and respect. I also wanted to, um, uh, to acknowledge, you know, what service delivery could look like. And when we're talking about people with lived experience, the question for me is always, hmm, what is it, what's the expectation from the entity or the agency or the organization of those of us with lived experience? And I think it was someone earlier who talked about, uh, who had made mention that it's not by way of providers who are selecting. And I think that that's important um, that we are including um, agencies and organizations to support that and that it's not one entity that is doing all of the selection, that people should be coming from the community and supported by providing a provider agencies in order to be able to clearly understand the challenges that they have versus just being, um, you know, like a one size fit all because it doesn't work that way. Um, you know, um, the, the tents, and criminalizing homelessness. Criminalizing homelessness looks uh, in so many different ways, you know, because when you think about criminalizing, we think about jails. And the truth of the matter is that uh, when you are unhoused uh, on the streets, 
you are in a prison. You know, we don't think about when we think about death, we always think about people who are literally dying. When the truth of the matter is, <laughs> I know for certain I, I was dead emotionally, you know, spiritually, mentally, you know, before um, I was housed. And that's something that had to be restored. Uh, in reference to uh, the overrepresentation of those who are unhoused, particularly Black people, and it's clear that it's across the United States that Black people are overrepresented, and, and as well as our Native Americans. I think that until we truly address what is really in front of us, that is then and only then will the doors open to change in reference to race, gender, you know, it doesn't matter age group or population until we really address, you know, black homelessness. And, and not only in that area, but all of those intersections of it is critical as well. Until we take a real good look at what Skid Row looks like and just, uh, just notice, you know, that it's a sea of black folk. Nothing, absolutely nothing uh, will change. But I think too that I want to close by uh, stressing something that I believe is very, very important. That people aren't able to use vouchers is a terrible thing. But I also want us to be into reality of what time it is today. We have two moratoriums that are soon to lift. December the 31st, the County of Los Angeles will lift its moratorium. And many people will be facing eviction. The city of Los Angeles, who holds the largest population of people, and I understand that that is equal to those who will be falling or facing eviction. But there, where's the safety net? What's in place? Where's that conversation that's being had about what happens to that population of people that are soon to fall? We have not been great at plugging the, the hole of the inflow. Um, the, for those who are falling today. So what happens then? I just think that it's a really a sad time. I also want to uplift the fact that we have a new mayor in Los Angeles. And, and I would hope that everyone would keep their eye on what I would like to call the prize, the prize for change that we are all hoping that will actually come as a result of our new mayor. But this is a sad time. You know, and no matter how we look at solutions, until we invest in the people that are unhoused and are on our streets, absolutely nothing will change. I appreciate research and researching what I'm saying today. You know, please research the investment into the people versus into the system. You know, we can hire consultants, we can have all of these outreach workers and you know, a host of medical teams, but the, the question becomes, and then what? Does that end a person's houselessness? And does that improve the quality of that individual's life? And do we have any social connection to the people that we're actually serving? I think it's a shame, the position in which we're currently in, but thank you. Well, thank you, Reba. Thank you so much. Um, I just, I just again want to reflect back. Um, you know that piece that sometimes the way that we think about rules and regulations. Um, it, it reminded me of one of our previous symposiums where we understood that people who experience substance use disorder take great benefit from those kinds of supports. Um, and so I invite others to, to check out that symposium um, in more depth. I, I learned so much and thank you for raising that point. And just that piece about supporting people's ability and uh, abilities in daily living. Um, and the, you know, we, just, we constantly need to, to hear that you know, it's not one size fits all for services. And, and it really gives me so much respect to our service providers who are really doing that work and recognizing it. And thank you, Reba, for, for bringing that because we really need to always see that as a touch a touchstone. And 
I'm just so, um, whenever you speak, I just feel so moved, uh, particularly what you said about people experiencing unsheltered homelessness and that being a form of criminalization. It makes me think of all these systems, you know, that have, have led to that. And um, I've just never thought about it as a form of criminalization, which is mm -hmm. such a powerful, a powerful way for us to think about the product of all of our, our all of our systems, and how they're creating that. Um, and 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 then thank you for grounding black homelessness. I think that you know if we can really meaningfully address black homelessness, all of us will benefit. And so thank you so much. Um, I can't I can't thank you enough for your leadership. And um, and I and I want to thank all of our panelists for their uh, really um, expert and candid and informed remarks. Um, and now we're going to take uh, we're going to take things. We're moving on to the next part of our time together uh, where we're going to have a facilitated um, panel discussion. And so I, I welcome Gary to take us into that section. Thank you, Saba, and thank you to everyone who spoke today. I think it's worth recognizing there's a little bit of a, a somber note right now, and justifiably, it, it ought to be somber. It also can be a moment where when we see the task in front of us, there's many people who may feel tempted to give up in terms of the work that they're doing or have done, or even as just a a local resident who's kind of said we tried X, Y, and Z, and I still see people, you know, as Reba noted, they're dying on the street. So now what? Um, and and I think that the reason we're all together here today is because we don't have that mentality of well, we tried things, now we give up. But we actually recognize that the systems that we put in place over the last decades and even beyond actually have led us to this point where we are. The reason, as you know, Chris noted that you can't do housing first without housing. If we can't talk about housing, then we can't even you know begin to talk about interim and permanent solutions and outreach and so forth is because we actually purposely tried to restrict people from living in our communities. Um, and the way that we kind of move forward um, is something that will take we actually need radical change in that. But in the meantime, we can't only figure out new ways to build housing. We have to address the needs of people who are currently living on the streets, living in their cars, living in interim settings, um, who are waiting for permanent housing. Um, if I could just pivot slightly, um, you know, as a research collaborative, engage with people with lived experience, practitioners and policy makers, I would love to invite our panelists to perhaps point to some recent research that you have done, that you have either seen spark new policy or practice, um, or perhaps change how people are thinking about addressing the needs of incredibly housing insecure people or people who are currently experiencing homelessness. I was certainly struck by you know, the work that Marisa, you've done in Portland with your colleagues to really advance doubled up homelessness as part of the conversation. I don't know if you have anything to say about that. Um, you know, as Rachel, you were talking about kind of the insights from the hotel motel pro program, which in California we called Project Room Key. I can't remember if what, what you called it up there. Um, are there certain insights that are immediately changing things there? But um, in general, and Chris, you mentioned a bunch of things, including safe parking and your work in Sacramento, et cetera, and your current work in Santa Clara County. But I wonder if there are places where you're seeing research being used or research being ignored that would actually help move us forward to address the needs that we see today. Marisa, I'll, I'll just kind of just for a different order, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you to go first, if you don't mind. Yeah, so we... <clears throat> We bring racial equity into all of our analyses, and sometimes that actually requires pushing back on what people want, or even how they're using um, secondary and quantitative analyses. So I think very traditional researchers will be like, we don't have significance, we cannot say. And we're like, well, can we at least see a trend, right? Can we, can we acknowledge that there is some validation? 
based on absolutely every data set out there, maybe except for this one. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, part of it is, I think, taking a very applied stance to research as opposed to being an academic purist. Um, I do want to just lift up something. I don't think that we study or do anything that people in community don't know and aren't telling us already. And that's kind of how we take our charge. Um, We say no to a lot of studies that elected officials might want or that um, certain government agencies might want because people in community are saying that could be used to harm us. Mm -hmm. Um, I try to bring a lens of, is this a waste of money because it's not telling you anything new or helpful? Um, And you know, that has varying levels of success, right? We see a lot of like emphasis on these studies that look at frequent utilizers, which even in and of itself is a disgusting framing of the of the idea that people who are um, frequently touching the criminal justice system and people who are seeing emergency room visits, if you prioritize them, then um, for housing, then they should go down. And the whole idea is that that's a cost to the system. Um, We actually did end up participating in one because community members, including staff, really thought it was important to making the case for funding in their particular jurisdiction um, to to actually run that analysis. And what we found was a surprise in that people of color were underrepresented in criminal justice contacts from what you would expect. Mm -hmm. And so part of our thing was like, unless you're going to actually add a racialized component to prioritization, you will be perpetuating racial inequities. Mm. Um, so I think that, that that's the kind of work where we show up. Um, I think the other big thing that we've done is that we successfully argued that the state and their future regional housing needs analysis count people experiencing homelessness as a need of a housing unit instead of a shelter space. And so mm. for people who know how... Um, Housing needs analysis are usually done. That's very census data driven. And we know that people experiencing homelessness are already undercounted in the data sets from the homelessness system, but even more so in the census. And so um, so spending a lot of time and helping them develop a metric using doubled up methodologies that are very basic, very simplistic. Mm -hmm. Um, to actually say we're going to add the need, identified need for housing based on the number of people experiencing homelessness. One of the things that I argue because people will be like, oh, we haven't deduplicated the Department of Education's double that population from the official HUD definition of homelessness is that when you get into the amount of housing all of our community needs, it's like fractions of the total. And so is it plus or minus 10,000 units? Well, when you need 125,000 units, who cares? Who cares if it's plus or minus, right? Just like put the funding together. So yeah, I'm starting to ramble. This is one of my like top topics. Thank you, Marisa. Chris, anything you can point to that where you see recent research here in California has shifted uh... work? I'll say, you said research that has been ignored. I'll go back to that. There's tons of research showing the <laughs> link between uh, tight housing markets and homelessness. We got to start listening to it. Uh, putting on my behavioral health research um, hat, there is um, this is not my research, but there's been a lot of research that has been focusing in on the social um, determinants of health. And that has led that CalAIM, which is a major innovation in the way that we spend Medicaid dollars in California, is going to have a housing component. And that is uh, that is a massive improvement. That is a major step forward. Uh, but it, it gets back to is that I, I, I just don't think it's going to work anywhere near as well when there is no affordable housing if you um, to house these people suffering from severe mental illness because of the, the, la- the lack of availability. Um, the other thing that I did was was in Seattle, we've had one of the problems that we have with homelessness is we don't really know the scope and the trends in the problem because our point in time counts, I say, are just ridiculously um, poor uh, uh, data gathering methods. Um, due to COVID and due to delays, uh, King County in Seattle was actually able to get the Housing and Urban Development Pro- Project to allow them to use um 
network-based random sampling survey techniques, which is there's just no reason not to do a much higher quality survey. And that's what's submitted for their pit count. I think that there's a lot of innovation that we can do. We can understand the dynamics of homelessness by doing it more frequently and get better data um, just by not trying to get an army of volunteers out on that one night in, in January. So I, I hope that uh, um, that HUD listens to the success of the uh, King County PIP count. Thank you, Chris. And, and Rachel and Felicia, if you can either respond in part to what Chris just said about some of the innovation there, but feel free to, you know, you may or may not have been involved in that. And so feel free to comment on research that has or hasn't been used in King County. Sure. So um, I want to, going back to the study I mentioned with the moving from um, congregate to, to hotel spaces, um, I was reflecting on with your question, Gary, that that was, I think, instrumental in building some of the political support for the permanent funding source to for the health through housing program that is now a kind of post-COVID permanent move towards um, acquiring some of these buildings. But also, you know, we had we worked as researchers in partnership with King County staff, in part because this was already the direction that things were going. So King mm -hmm. County wasn't a funder of the study directly, but they're uh, allowing their evaluation team to be working on this research and using their data towards the research process was instrumental. So it's a little bit of a chicken and egg situation where it was where the winds were blowing. Everybody knew it was a good idea. And lo and behold, we had a successful project that influences policy. So also as kind of a policy scholar, it's hard to tell where the agenda setting starts and ends and where, um, where the research is influencing. But it was definitely reinforcing. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, I think to Marisa's point, I was recently on a call around, um, you know, with some local government providers and or, and uh, or local government staff and researchers, and they were saying, well, we want we need to get better data on how um, on why people are turning away services during outreach that they just write down that they just want to go to a tiny house village. And, and we need to, like, have better data to say that. And I was like. I don't understand. You just said you know exactly why they're turning down the resources available. Like, do you need to collect better data on that? Or is this something that we know and that there's actually no reason to invest research dollars and be asking people questions about? Because it seems pretty obvious that you're offering kind of a high barrier shelter option when what they want is independence. So like, I don't know. And it was like, well, for political reasons, we really kind of need to have these data. And I was like, OK, well, good luck with that. But to me, that doesn't sound like a worthwhile research endeavor. Mm. So just interesting how the idea of research, I think, mm. is reinforcing of some of the political will. And I think um, it's a privileged position to be at a university role where we are absolutely communi community members, but can can agree to do it or not agree based on whether we see independent value and whether or not it's going to be a benefit to the community as a whole rather than towards a particular political purpose. Um, and the last thing I'll just say kind of vaguely is that I was involved with a research project um, where we collected in data in 2019 before the pandemic. This has been hunted, uh, funded through HUD's um, Office of Policy and Research. And we submitted our report a year ago, and it is still not published. Um, and my understanding is in part because of local political opposition. So uh, in, in some maybe folks who also working with collaboratively. Mm -hmm. So just also to say that uh, it's it can be a sticky, a sticky space in terms of doing research, wanting to be a, a good researcher, representing mm -hmm. um, really the voices of what's happening. And that sometimes is what people want to read in terms of leaders and policymakers. And sometimes it's not. Thank you, Felicia. Anything from your perspective as a, a leader? Yeah, I think so. coming from local government before assuming this role, you know, we have noted for years the challenges with the point in time count and that methodology um, across the nation. I know you know, HUD argues that it's still the most consistent way to track data around unsheltered homelessness, but we have much better data sets now in our community, including development of what we call a by name list. So really having accurate real-time information about who is experiencing homelessness in our community and what their unique needs are. So um, I'm heartened about some of the changes that were made, again, thanks to the pandemic and, and you know, some of the um, creativity that it allowed in our community. 
Um, but I would like to see better use of data that's not just for program performance um, and for federal funding, but really about how do we serve people in real time and make mm -hmm. strategic decisions off of that data as well. And unfortunately, again, the point in time count data does not serve us well in that capacity. So um, I know that lots of other communities are struggling with this as well. Thank you, Felicia. Um, I, it was alluded to by quite a number of people that either in their communities or others, um, there is a movement afoot to compel people either to move from the tent that they live to another place. So in Los Angeles, we have an ordinance in the city called, which has this number 4118. If you're not familiar with it, you can look it up. Um, it was mentioned by Chris in his opening remarks uh, that this was a, a this was what came across your desk this morning. Others um, also mentioned that this notion of compelling people to either be somewhere else or 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 not um, is part of the strategy that that you're seeing in your communities in our high cost communities. We're also seeing kind of the compelling of people who have serious mental illness through care courts in California. We saw the mayor of New York, which is also a high cost area, but has a different policy environment, um, note the same thing that he was going to start compelling people with serious mental illness into particular programs. Um, I don't know if, you know, from your perspectives as researchers in these high cost areas, what do you make of this change? I bet you're like me. You get asked by reporters all the time. What do you think about this? And you provide an answer. <laughs> um, if you'd like to provide an answer today, I'd be happy to hear it. And then if, if you don't have something, that's fine. And we'll move to the next question. Chris, to give you a chance to start it off, any, any response immediately on that issue of compelling? Yeah, I'm forgetting the name of the case, but in the Ninth Circuit, you are not allowed to criminalize public camping unless the, there is shelter space. Communities have been consistently loot. You know, they, they put forth these anti-camping uh, laws, then they, they lose in court. It's been this constant uh, cycle recently. On um, the care court um, concept, uh, it, you know, th 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 there are personal liberty issues because you're compelling someone against their will to ex accept services. But there's lots of reasons to believe that people with serious mental illness really do need that extra step. What is really important is looking at Laura's law. This whole um, care court um, concept is, in fact, replacing a law that's been around for 20 years in uh, in California called Laura's Law, which you, can, which you can bring in a service resistant person in front of a judge and then get them to accept services. You will be amazed to hear that when you outreach and bring people into Laura's court, 80% of the people that are um, contacted and referred into this program voluntarily go into services without ever going in front of a judge. When I hear that, it's not, I say it's like, how, what more clear evidence than you can say? It's not the legal compelling people to get services, but if you offer someone housing and real services, they will accept that. So um, uh, I'm not against um, uh, Gavin Newsom's care court concept, but again, if you read the fine print, it's really talking about, oh, and we will figure out the housing part of this later on. We can't figure it out later on. We have to have that in place first. Thank you, Chris. Uh, any thoughts, uh, Rachel, Felicia from King County about compelling people? Yeah, I mean, just to build on what Chris said, I think that's absolutely right. You know, again, having uh, folks with lived experience themselves in our decision making tables has really helped people understand what it takes for people to be successful in services and to accept services. The problem is that we are not offering things that people want or need. And that is really the discussion that we need to be having is how do we have a robust service infrastructure that actually meets people's needs? I'm offering someone a, a you know, mat on the floor where they have to be out by 6 a.m. Not a lot of people are going to say yes to that, right? Because it does not accommodate their pets, their partners, you know, other things that they may be needing um, again in crisis. And I think we forget that people make decisions based off of their needs. And so um, really listening to people and where they're at and what's going to be successful for, for them, I think, is where we um, sometimes are missing the mark here. And again, to Chris's point, 
all of that needs to be tied back to housing. So if we're offering services without meaningful opportunities for people to come inside, um, we know that they're not going to be as successful with those services. It doesn't create that baseline of safety and comfort for them to then um, thrive in other areas of their lives. So it always has to be accompanied by meaningful, safe, and stable housing, um, again, for them to be really meaningfully engaged in those services. One, oh, sorry, one other thing I would add to that, that we're doing here in our community is we're really trying to transform our outreach services as well. Um, and something that's been successful in the behavioral health space is peer services. And so we're now employing people with lived experience of homelessness to do that outreach service um, as it relates to homelessness. So they've been through the system, they've navigated the system, and they are able to build uh, a more trusting relationship with people living unsheltered in our community, which I also think helps uh, navigate, again, the, the complications of the service infrastructure here. So we're seeing a lot of success with that as well. Thanks, Felicia. Rachel, you were about to go off mic. Yes. Um, and I, I just want to reinforce this idea around the importance of housing, especially as I think various parts of our conversation have have emphasized some of the service components. Um, I think that we need to think about our um, our interventions and services also in a way that is providing permanent stable housing. So I've done research with folks who've been offered rapid rehousing, found an apartment, and they don't take it because they have to sign a 12 month lease that's going to extend beyond the time that the funding is going to allow. So for them, it's not permanent housing, even though it mm. it might we it might fall under the guise of permanent housing because they don't see a way that they're going to be able to afford it when the subsidy is inevitably run out because rapid rehousing is not a permanent funding source for an individual to receive housing. So as we talk about the role of services and services engagement, I do want us to be careful that participation in services should never be contingent, should be part of maintaining your housing as a requirement. So I think it's one thing as uh, providing opportunities for different um, different ways to engage in services and be part of a community and learn, um, you know, relearn some of the things that might help someone move away from a supportive um, housing environment to a more independent housing environment. But all of that should be done without kind of that participation as a condition of staying in their housing. Because as soon as we introduce that threat of losing housing, we've um, we've reintroduced mm -hmm. the crisis of homelessness even when folks are still technically housed. Mm -hmm. Right. Thanks, Rachel. Reba and Marisa, on this issue of compelling people to be in a different place or to receive a service that whatever, as you noted, Chris, the, the law might say, you know, someone classify someone as a service resistant individual. What's happening in our communities in LA and in Portland? Either Reba or Marissa can go first. Yeah, I'll 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 jump right in. You know, I think that it's really important read. for us to take a look at whether or not, you know, where is the empowerment? Where is in, where is empowerment? Where is um, uh, self esteem, self worth, self confidence? Where are these things that actually build folk uh, to feel good about themselves from the inside out? And the system today. Uh, in my opinion, is more of a codependent and enabler to people because there are some of us who are capable, let me use that word again, the C word, capable of doing more for ourselves and desire to do so. The other is around the types of housing or interim housing that is in play. Shelters are not friendly. They're, they consist of a variety of people because we're not even thoughtful, in my opinion, enough to ensure that we are placing people in an area or in an environment that is suitable to them and an attractive place mm -hmm. to be in. Not, and I'm going to go back to um, services. You know, where's the trust? How do we trust someone when all we want to do is ask a series of questions in which you've selected? versus a psychosocial, and particularly for those of us who may not have severe mental illness, but do ex experience high levels of stress, anxiety, and depression. It changed my life, the psychosocial, changed my life because it allowed me an opportunity to be with someone, to have a conversation versus just a series of questions. So I think that we should really take a look at enabling and codependency um, in, in the areas of the services that are coming. Thank you, Reba. Marisa? Um, I guess I just want to 
I, I think I'm reinforcing what Reba said that, you know, it's it's about trusting people, believing in people, giving them the space to be who they are. And it also sometimes means having more options than PSH or housing first, right? Some people do want to go into sober living, right? And so I think it's about listening to people and what they want and how we provide it. I think of the term service resistant is really more about us not having identified the services that people need to succeed. Um, and I I just think that when we try to coerce people into doing things, it's just, I mean, it's terrible. Um, the last thing I would say is that I think that in the chat and some of what Rita was getting at is that we have to tackle the, the reality that our buildings are not being well managed. And I have been in a study, one of my colleagues has been in a study that the entire purpose of this study was deterred because all people wanted and needed to talk about was the conditions of their building. The management, the lack of true support for people with severe or serious mental illness or substance use disorders, the buildings, the communities have to be the right ones. And if we are not gonna hold our nonprofits accountable for how buildings are being created and developed, we're not, it's not gonna work. Right. Thank you, Marisa. Um, while I, I have a, a question about the issue of prevention and how it's coming up in your own research and in practice, I know we have a lot of questions um, in the chat, a lot of questions on the Q&A function. Um, so if we have time, I'll come back to the issue of prevention and policy and practice there. Saba, have you had time to kind of look through the chat and so forth and, and maybe offer some questions that have emerged from our audience for the panelists? I have, and thank you everyone for just deepening this really rich discussion. And so I will start us off with um, this first question that I think we can direct to Chris. And uh, thank you, Chris, for noting ADUs as a, as a possibility for responding to our housing crisis here in California. And so the question is, what steps are being taken to discourage landlords who build ADUs, but are renting these out at market rate? Um, and the relevancy well, of that. I'll make uh, two comments. One, um, the housing crisis is so deep right now that I have no objection for people building market rate housing because increasing the supply, I'm an, enough of an economist to believe that increasing the supply will drive down prices eventually. But at the same time, that's not a short-term solution at all. And many of the financing solutions that I alluded to of low or no interest loans um, do come with restrictions on this. So that in Marin County, uh, one of the land trusts will give you $50,000 loan to build an ADU, and then you don't have to pay anything back until your property is sold. So that may be that may be never, but the condition is that it has to be rent. Uh, it has to be rented at affordable levels. So th that type of model can work. It still makes the ADU a good investment from the homeowner's perspective. So it's not like we're asking them to donate to homelessness. We're asking them to invest in their retirement, invest in their future, but at the same time, invest in their community. And, and we can help them do that. Excellent. Thank you for sharing that piece. Did, did anyone else want to respond to that question? I know Chris had sort of introduced that um, to this conversation. Okay. Um, so this is for everyone. How are you all in other cities dealing with the intersectionality of homelessness, substance abuse, and drug dealers in your communities? Um, and I think, why don't we uh, go ahead and start with, uh, well, anyone who would like to um, start us off is welcome, because um, I just want to invite people to comment on, you know, what what they find um, is, is relevant from their community, um, instead of, you know, assigning people. Uh, so feel free to unmute yourself. You know, as I said, there is plenty of evidence to show that if you integrate people who are formerly homeless, severe mental illness, recovering from a substance abuse disease in the community, instead of concentrating them in a single area, 
that it greatly benefits those individuals without degrading the community. So Skid Row in Los Angeles, the Tenderloin in San Francisco are, if, if you have experienced trauma, if you have a serious mental illness and are trying to create stability in your life, those areas do not provide that at all because just being there is traumatizing. So in, in an effort to isolate this from the main community, we actually have exacerbated the problem. Um, it's, it, but it, uh, that is a, a question that will, will take an enormous amount of political leadership because the resistance you get from placing um, people who are formerly homeless, people with severe mental illness in a variety of communities, you always get a lot of pushback. And um, if you're a city council member, I can, I, uh, I don't support it, but I understand why at, at some point they just don't want to be dealing, riling up the community and creating um, that type of resistance. If you've ever been to a community, a city council meeting where they're talking about placing a permanent supportive housing unit, you understand how uh, passionate people get this and what a big problem from a political perspective this is for our leaders. We need to change the conversation. So I wanna um, push back a little bit on, I think part of what Chris is saying, which is I actually don't think we have strong evidence or really any evidence that all people experiencing severe addiction and mental health crisis are better in scattered site kind of units. I think that there's an issue when we put a lot of buildings in one place. So I 100% agree that we shouldn't have what we do have, which is entire neighborhoods that are concentrating um, folks in housing subsidies. And we would be in a much stronger position to the extent that we um, are you know affirmatively furthering fair housing and and the things that ensure that our community our all of our neighborhoods are accessible to folks of different economic backgrounds. Um, but I think fundamentally we have an issue of housing choice as the challenge. And what we're missing are opportunities for folks who need affordable housing, but not the full suite of services to um, to choose where they want to live. Because we actually, I think, have a lot of evidence that permanent supportive housing, both in a scattered site kind of uh, setting and in a single building, is really successful for a lot of people experiencing this deepest level of challenge. I mean, we have decades of evidence now, and they're not all um, from doing this. I started a randomized control trial study um, with Samson Barris and um, Dan Malone at DESC looking at like this idea of fit, right? That folks might, some folks are going to do better in a scattered site environment and some folks are going to do better in a single site environment. For various complications, we were never able to do that research. But I, I think there's still, um, yeah, I just don't think we know that all folks are going to be better um, when they don't have a, a full, the full kind of suite of community that can be offered in some of the um, uh, more, you know, there, there, there are better managed uh, housing that's not there's there's a lot of kind of all housing in this conversation. I just want to say there's a wide range of what's being provided and certainly a lot can be improved. Um, but I think, yeah, just when we don't have an opportunity for folks to move out of permanent supportive housing into permanent affordable housing without that full suite of supports, then what we're doing is forcing everyone into the same bucket without real choice. And that's a huge problem. So I um, there's real need there. Oh, thank you so much, Rachel, for illuminating that. Um, so the next question, is helping people stay in housing once they're initially placed something that also needs to be addressed? I think, you know, that's kind of, we have been addressing that um, in in several ways. I know um, in, in these recent uh, comments, um, and then Marisa had mentioned earlier in the Q&A um, about the accountability of providers in this work. So um, would like to go ahead and hand that off uh, maybe to Felicia to share with us. Thanks, Saba. Trying to get my unmute on. <laughs> mm -hmm, great. Yeah, I think, you know, working in partnership in our community is, is really important. And so we're trying to bring um, all folks along, including providers, including people with lived experience, including business, philanthropy. You know, we've had a lot of transformation here um, because of the narrative changes. And I know I'd mentioned that earlier in my introductory statements is there was a lot of 
uh, backlash in our community to the growing numbers of people living unsheltered, particularly when COVID had started. Um, and it, we saw you know, an increase in behavioral health crises in our downtown cores. Um, we also saw a lot of people you know, active with active substance use uh, in very public places. And I think to Rachel's point, you know, as we were de-intensifying some of our congregate shelter, we didn't have great alternatives for where people could go. And so again, people are making rational decisions about how to protect themselves um, and how to stay safe during this pandemic as we were all learning alongside of them. And I think the thing that gets, uh, you know, lost sometimes as we talk about, um, you know, sweeping encampments and moving people along who are living unsheltered is that, people form communities um, with other people. And so we're always, you know, as humans, really seeking those relationships, those community relationships with people that understand us. And so for people that are living in encampments, you know, amongst other folks, it's very difficult to remove them from those spaces because that is their safety net. Those are the, the you know, the relationships that keep them healthy, that keep them safe um, in a very unsafe situation, which is being unsheltered, right? Um, particularly when there's a lot of anger and um, assumptions being made by by other folks that don't know people who are experiencing homelessness. And so that's that's part of what we try to do is to talk about um, why people make those choices and why that's safer for them in those set, in those settings. And then from a service perspective, um, you know, for providers who've really done a lot of outreach and a lot of work, as Rachel said, they already knew what people wanted, what they were asking for and what was going to help them move into more permanent situations. It's just that those were not things that were part of our service infrastructure. And so how do we take those lessons from the real outreach that's happening on the streets and from people that have been in those experiences and translate in that into the way that we do business, the way that we do work. And then you know, part of that work too is then communicating to the more general public, to elected officials about what it's gonna take and when they can expect to see those results. Um, you know, we've learned a lot from what's happened in Los Angeles, and I know it was spoken about earlier today too, is how do you build community trust for something that's going to take a long time? So how do you set reasonable expectations about what funding is gonna be used by when and how it's gonna really support the community? Again, for communities like ours up and down the West Coast that have such high numbers of people experiencing homelessness, we're talking about tens of thousands of people who are living on shelter in our communities, you're not going to see an overnight change. You're not going to have one mayor or one council member announce a pilot program and then see visible results, you know, within a year or with even within the four years that they're serving our community. And so I think really, how do we set expectations for the public so that they understand what's going to be changing, um, how we're going to be serving people, how we're changing lives, but also being clear that these are long-term goals, that housing and and homelessness interventions are infrastructure for our communities. So the same way we set expectations about, you know, transportation projects, right? That maybe you won't see, but your kids will see and their kids will see. That's the way we need to be talking about housing and homelessness services. And again, the, the basic infrastructures that help our communities thrive. Thank you so much, Felicia. And I want to I want to give Reba a chance to weigh in on this question uh, about about helping people stay housed um, once they're initially placed. So there's a lot of things. Uh, first of all, I, I want to acknowledge this is a very painful subject, um, topic around prevention because uh, there's so many layers to it. And I think that in order to really address prevention that we have to really address how did we get here? So we're not just here it keeps getting worse. It's not getting better. You know, we're like men who have lost their legs. They never grow new ones. Seriously. And until we begin to really look at the truth about what is actually happening, and then we talk about prevention, how are we even not only preventing people, but how are we, how are we growing folk to move on, to move away? you know, to advance so that they'll make room for those Section 8 vouchers or affordable housing units or whatever. I mean, it's going to take, I mean, it's almost like a machine. And until we create, a, you know, this machine that actually empowers people, that's number one. But I have written something down and, you know, the truth is about how do we get here, but also, you know, solutions, solutions to uh, to all of this. 
You know, and if we don't talk to the government about, you know, this these high vouchers that tells other landlords who won't even take Section 8 that, you know, they can get a certain amount of money, nothing's going to change. And then the other is about prevention in reference to really uh, holding our mainstream systems accountable. Where are our drug and alcohol treatment facilities? Where are they? How do you get in? When if I'm on the street and I knock on the door, I want a door to answer. So someone used the word expectation. Well, guess what? We have some and it's continuous disappointment. So I just, I need to blow that off on you guys, uh, <laughs> on us, <laughs> all of us today, because the truth of the matter is that prevention is not just about prevention the way we want to think about it. We have to think very broad and very roomy about it because it's also retention that should also be included in that as well. Thank you, Reba, for always speaking from your heart as well as your mind. Um, so we're, we're nearing the end of our session today. And so I want to introduce kind of a, a final question. Um, and it goes like this, when it comes to the housing market as a root cause and condition, what can COCs or COC governance leaders do? Uh, legislative advocacy, partnerships with planners, partnering with tenant unions. What have you seen or what do you envision? Uh, this, this questioner it works with COC stakeholders who want to set goals but aren't sure where to start. Um, so actually I'll, I'll go to uh, Marisa for this question, um, just per what you shared about the work you've done at your COC. Yeah, so this is interesting because, you know, it's whatever department the COC is attached to may or may not have any actual control over housing. And so I think, that it has to be a political act. Um, you know, we did a survey did, while I was on the COC to see where people wanted the kind of work they wanted to do. And there was a pretty even split between people who thought that we should be doing true advocacy and legislative pushes versus people who thought that that was not an appropriate role. Interestingly, there was um, people of color were more likely to want to actually do the political advocacy than people who are white. Um, we did have elected officials on our board, which complicates things, but I think that your, your continuum can be advocates, can be pushing, can make a point of saying, this is the number of housing units we need available to address homelessness and setting their own goal, I mean, setting their own and analyzing their own needs and then going out and being like, where are these units coming from? One of the things that I, I see here in Portland that always gives me so much heartburn is that a lot of times I'll see the homeless services providers who also uh, are landlords for housing compete with other affordable housing providers for the limited funding, saying we need PSH units at the expense of other affordable housing units instead of working with the other affordable housing providers to say, no, what we need is just more units. So I think it's advocating for what you know you need from your system and identifying that, but then building coalition to fight for what is actually needed in terms of a large housing stock. Thank you so much, uh, Marisa. Uh, may I invite Rachel to comment? Yeah, thank you. And I'll actually just, add on to what Marisa said, I think that when advocacy, uh, put on my kind of advocacy scholarship hat, when advocacy happens and it feels really self-interested, it's not as effective. So when the COCs say, we need more subsidized housing, we need more PSH units, it just feels like, okay, we're build, continuing to build this homelessness industrial complex. 
when instead they kind of get their heads out of the sand and say, our community has a problem, as Chris said, at every single level of the housing market. And what we need is more housing, some of which is subsidized, some of which may be small family units, some of which may be larger units in areas with schools, some of which may be putting schools in places where there aren't schools so that families might want to live in those neighborhoods. Whatever it is, it's not all in the domain of the COC. Their voice is going to be much more powerful and they're going to find new allies who also believe in those goals. So I think we've just seen too much segmentation of kind of like, I'm just going to tunnel vision the part that's relevant to me and my funding and not look at this larger issue. And to the extent that the COCs can really be part of the regional conversations around improving housing opportunities at all levels, I think would be super impactful. Mm, terrific. Chris? Uh, well, I second everything that Marisa said. Um, COCs are politically are not in a very good position because they are dependent on the local political leadership to support their work. They are running very important programs. Um, so being at the, which constrains their ability to be really strong advocates. Though uh, I, I do agree with Rachel's has made a lot of very good points that strategically they can really um, place the community in the right place. Uh, I will go back to um, a, a board member of a nonprofit um, uh, that I have, the uh, Center for Homeless Inquiries. And um, she is the author, was also the author of that report I cited in 1980 by the Legislative Analyst's Office saying how, how that we California was constructing way too few housing. Her, her take on this, I'm, I'm not going to, uh, I, I will keep a, an arm's length away from she goes, we should eliminate all local approval for housing projects. It should be a state approval. If you, uh, I will say one interesting thing is that Tokyo in the, from 1990 to 2000, I believe that's the decade that, um, that, that this research is from, increased its population by a million people. At the beginning of the decade, it had zero developable land. At the end of the decade, it housed an, an additional million people within its within its city limits. How did it do that? It was tearing down a lot of four-story buildings and building a lot of 10-story buildings in its place. How can you possibly do that, you look at? Tokyo, the city, has absolutely zero control over land use. It's a national policy in Japan. So uh, the, the hyper-localization of these decisions I understand people care about their communities, but we are paying the price for that political dynamic. Wow. Thank you for bringing in an international focus. I just, I know we're really, really tight on time. I just want to pass to Reba real quick if there's any comment you wanted to make. You know, I just think that um, it's really important for us to remember, um, you know, why we're all here. Um, mm -hmm what the primary, what the real goal is, and that whatever you believe in, um, you know, if it's God, if it's Buddha, you know, that that's a source of power mm. that's greater than all of us. And there are people outside, you know, and the best that we could do is continue to have conversation around what to do. And the truth of the matter is, we really know. We have the answer. And the answer is accountability, 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 and change. Mm. That's all I got, Zill. I don't even want to touch that, and but I'm supposed to be one the one to close us out. Uh, <laughs> that was just thank you, Reba, for, for bringing us to our conclusion and just tremendous gratitude for each of our panelists and uh, so grateful for what you shared and the learning that we had as a community and grateful for our participants and their active, um, you don't know, their active response and questions around this conversation and all the work that you're doing in your communities. And I am just grateful uh, to be in, in this role um, alongside Gary, uh, you know, with our collaborative at HPRI. And so with that, I'll, I'll pass it on to Gary for, for his last uh, remarks. 
Thank you, Saba. And thank you again to everyone who's here representing your communities and the work that you're doing to help those who are suffering the most. Um, I mentioned as I transitioned into kind of the Q&A session that it's easy for us to feel despondent, but I think you also heard from people who are doing this amazing work in research and in practice that we can actually make the change. It may not happen this year, it may not happen next, but if we put ourselves in this situation over decades, we can get ourselves out if we have that will. And I appreciate what you ended with, Reba, and the accountability to ourselves that we ought to do this and we can do this. And with that, I wish everybody a happy holiday season and we look forward to reconvening again with you in the new year. Bye for now. Be well, everyone.